If you're able, won't you please stand with me for a call to worship? Happy are those who take delight in the law of the Lord. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous. Let us worship God. Let us pray. Holy God, let the words of our mouths bring you peace. Let the words that we speak be seasoned with your love and grace. May the things, O Lord, that we choose to say bring glory, not shame, to your name each day. Let the words of our mouth bring you praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Won't you turn and greet one another this morning? I think Dan just threatened to turn me down. That... <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's Valentine's Day. I'm used to being turned down, so but uh, I'll be here all morning. Uh, well, today, um, I, I suppose you all are aware that this after this evening is like the biggest sporting event of the year, right? Harley. No, no, Harley. It's 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 the mono bob sled runs that are that that, that and that's what I'm all about. <laughs> Is there something else going on? Oh, the Snoop Dogg concert, um, because, yeah, Super Bowl, but um, I notice, I notice most of, a lot of you are in black today. Um, I, think, I think it must be morning because the Chiefs aren't playing. Um, Jerry, Jerry is wearing red, but to be clear, she's wearing red because tomorrow is Valentine's Day, so I wish you a happy Valentine's Day as, as well. Um, I don't have any announcements this morning, um, but are there any prayer concerns or joys to lift up? Yeah, Dan? Yeah, uh, Chris, this one, I asked everybody to pray. Leah is having surgery tomorrow. Oh. And totally. So, I'm going to keep it great for her. Definitely. 
Are you guys spending the night out there? Or are you spending? You going to drive out in the morning? Yeah, we're going to drive out in the morning. Okay. okay. Well, our prayers definitely go with you, Levada, and as well as with those taking care of you. So. Levon, um, I saw him on Thursday. He was um, he was kind of worn out. He'd done a lot of walking on Wednesday, which is great news. Um, and he um, and um, he they had moved him to solid foods at least a little bit. He wasn't eating a whole lot, but um, he was eating soft solid foods, um, applesauce and. Um, and scrambled eggs and such, but he um, he was in good spirits. It looks like he's coming home tomorrow, um, so um, prayers have definitely been appreciated. I think um, certainly prayers as he as he gets home that he'll continue to take care of himself. Um, my understanding is that they took the dogs up either Friday or yesterday to visit him through the window. So um, I know that I know that helped a lot. But um, he is he's moving in, he's moving in good directions. So. Um, a lot to a lot to give thanks for, and um, it just you know, and it, it's been one of the I, the hardships of this kind of Corona season, um, the fear of spreading, um, of get, getting other people sick, and of spreading it to patients, um, causes limits in visitation to happen, and yet the the harm done by not having people with people is so severe too so it, it was a true gift that they were able to um to let the family in the hospital um larry told me the hospital kind of made the decision that well when you guys are here you just hang out in his room anyhow you're not in and out a lot um so they've let them come and go a little more than they have other families and it really i think has made all the difference for levance so um so a lot to be a lot to be thankful for there. Um, Chris, I, I think you, um, I know several people have asked Sheila and you, um, no real update that you're headed to um, Wichita at the end of the week to, um, to con continue getting consultations. So our prayers go with you as well. Anyone else this morning? I think while it's um, not even close to our backyard, I think the, the tensions between um, the Ukraine and Russia um, we keep getting word that any day invasions may happen and who knows what the consequences will be there. I, I certainly would encourage us to be in prayer for, um, for peace in, the, in that region um, and, um, and that everyone, all the leaders of the world, use wisdom in, in how to respond. So um, there's nothing else this morning. Um, we remember in, as we gather to worship um, that, that only God can really understand the true nature of our heart. We even deceive ourselves. Um, and God knows where we are faithful and righteous, but God also knows where we wander astray. And so, as we are people who are prone to wander, the call is for us to confess the ways that we've turned from the one who knows us and who saves us and to bathe in his mercy and grace. So let us pray together our prayer of confession and then spend time in silent personal confession. Let us pray. Loving God, our relationships with each other are not all that they should, can or should be. There is hurt and injury between us and others. There are walls of anger and hatred between us and our neighbors. We speak words that wound, believing the lie that sticks and stones may break bones, but that words will never hurt. Forgive us for how we deny our part in this and for how we blame others for the brokenness around us. Forgive how we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We believe that you offer to us in our world a whole and good life. For all that we have done to deny this life to each other and to ourselves, we ask your forgiveness and your mercy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, hear the good news. As you choose again this day to love God and to love one another, know that God has forgiven you that which is past and offers you to you a new and full life.
Praise be to the name of God now and forever and ever. Alleluia. Amen. Let us continue singing of our wonderful Savior as we sing Nothing But the Blood, number 266. Please be seated. As we prepare to present our tithes and offerings, may we remember that God has led us to prosperity, and so our call is to return to God a portion of that which we have been given. So bring your tithes, bring your offerings filled with joyous hearts.
Let us pray. God of deliverance, who in Christ brings soundness of mind, clarity of vision, wholeness of bodies, and wisdom to all we say and do, receive now the fruits of Christ's work in us. May what we give be used to make known Christ's healing presence so that all may live with assurance of the new life that you offer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, our scripture reading this morning continues our journey through the the Sermon on the Mount as we come to Matthew 5, um, 20 through 25. You can find it starting on page 684 of the Bibles there in the pews if you'd like to follow along. Hear now the word of the Lord. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. You have heard it said, it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in the danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still together on the way, or your adversary may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. Let us pray. Almighty God and our gracious Heavenly Father, in the presence of your bounty, keep us humble. In the presence of all people's needs, make us compassionate and caring. Give us faith in our praying and love in our serving, knowing that by your power all may find a new balance in living and a new victory in adversity. Lord, we pray for unhappy lives, those who are bitter and resentful, feeling life has given them a raw deal. Those who are sensitive to criticism and quick to take offense. Those who desire their own way, whatever the inconvenience or cost to others. May your judgment and your mercy be for their healing. We pray for those who are lonely, who are shy and self-conscious, who find it hard to make friends. Those who are nervous and timid, who ever feel themselves strangers in a world they can scarcely understand. May your presence inspire confidence and ensure companionship. We pray for those who live with bitter regrets, for loving relationships brought to ruin, for opportunities freely given and woefully abused, for the bitterness of defeat or betrayal at another's hand, or for a failure in personal integrity. May your grace give new hope to find victory in the very scene of failure. We pray for all in illness and pain, weary of the day and fearful of the night. Grant healing if it be your will, and at all times through faith give the gift of your indwelling peace. Lord, bless bless the company of Christ's folk, the church in every land. Make her eager in worship, fearless in proclamation of the gospel, and passionate for caring. Bless our country, bless our leaders, bless our children, and grant us peace within our borders. Grant us as a nation to be found effective in establishing peace throughout the world. Bless us, each one, in the communion of the saints, and keep us ever mindful of the great cloud of witnesses that that are following in their steps, as they did in the steps of the Master. May May we with them at the last receive the fulfillment promised to your people. We pray all of this through Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
In 2007, the book, The Year of Living Biblically, One Man's Humble Quest to Follow the Bible as Literally as Possible was published. The book was a hit. The, the concept behind the book was um, that the author, A.J. Jacobs, would spend the year following all the rules that he could find in the Bible. He came up with more than 700 of them. Um, now, Jacobs was himself not a person of faith. He was Jewish by heritage, but he'd grown up in kind of a culturally Jewish um, home, but was really an agnostic. They, they identified themselves as being Jewish because of things like the Holocaust and the difficulties that, that Jews had been through, but there was no real faith. And his point was really to show um, the foolishness of following the Bible, particularly following the Bible literally. So he went about keeping the rules. Unfortunately, and I'm going to suggest that he totally missed the point of faith by doing that. He decided to become a very religious person. But I want to suggest something, that religion isn't all that great. That, that religion isn't what saves the day. He went through the practices of, of obedience to rules, and he missed the point. As a matter of fact, I'm going to say Christianity is not religion. In fact, it's quite distinct from religion. Make no mistake, there are, there are definitely religious people in, in the scriptures. In the New Testament, we most often see these religious people identified as scribes and Pharisees, in case you haven't been keeping up with your Bible lately. They are not the most popular people in scripture. Jesus doesn't tend to, to look down on it, to look at them very, very well. If you wanted a simple grouping of them, we would call them the religious folk of Scripture. Jesus' attitude was not so great towards them. When Jesus would get near worldly people, he had this tendency to be kind and patient, abounding in grace. But when he gets near religious leaders, Jesus' tone has a tendency to get a, a little more sharp. At the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' sermon, not, not this sermon today, Jesus ends by saying, there are two ways ahead of you that you can either build a house on the sand or you can build it on the rock. Firm foundation, shaky foundation. I'm sure you probably remember the kid's song if you were in Sunday school growing up. The, the house on the sand, the water came up, and the ring came in, the, yeah, all that. Um, firm foundation, shaky foundation. Uh, on the surface, the two places may seem very much the same. They may look both great. The, from the exterior, you may not be able to tell what kind of foundation it was built on. But one of the houses is going to collapse while the other stands. Two ways of living is what Jesus is pointing out. And I think those two ways are important for us to understand. Traditionally, it's been interpreted that, that the two ways are either obedience to God laws or not. Life or destruction. Um, but Tim Keller, who um, is just a, a brilliant teacher and a student of the Word, um, said some things that changed my view. He says at its heart, the message isn't about being good or bad. Following the rules or not, obedience or disobedience. That's not what the message is. He says, look at the Sermon on the Mount. And it's kind of scary. When, when you go through the sermon, Jesus doesn't say, here are people who pray and here are people who don't pray. He says, you pray this way, but you should pray like this. Jesus doesn't say, some people obey the Ten Commandments and some people don't. No, he says, you obey the commandments this way, but you should obey it like this. Here's what the scary thing is. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount is contrasting two ways, and both groups are obeying God's law. Both groups are obeying the Ten Commandments, and, and yet one is a house built on a bad foundation. You can go to worship, you can give to the poor, you can pray, you can read your Bible every day, you can be good with your quiet times and still be building your house on the sand. Does that scare you? Honestly, it, it, it should. It scares me. A lot of think, people think that Christianity is about leaving an immoral lifestyle behind and living according to the Bible, the year of living biblically. But that's not the answer. Just doing that, just jumping through the hoops, is nothing more than religion. It may be part of what we do, 
But it isn't the point. The the key is that Jesus says, if you want to live in the kingdom of heaven, there is this gospel goodness that's going to surpass any kind of religious righteousness. In in, in the next few weeks, I I hope that we can start to see that. And and in the end, that we'll understand that this gospel righteousness is, is brighter because it's deeper, because it's sweeter, because it's and higher. My, my initial career plan was that I was going to be a lawyer. I liked the rules. If you've, if you've ever heard of the Myers-Briggs personality inventory, um, it breaks down kind of personality traits in, into a grouping. And, and one of them is um, you may be a J. You, you, may, you may like the rules. Judgment is, is what. It doesn't mean you're judgmental, but it means that you kind of like the rules. I like rules. Um, and, and so I wanted to be a lawyer so that I could punish people. I, I was not going to be a defense attorney. I, I was definitely going to be a DA. Um, and then I wanted to be a judge because I wanted people to obey. And, go, and going through college, I had my eyes set resolutely on this goal. And, and my course load reflected that. I, I took a number of courses in the law. My favorite that I wound up taking was constitutional law. In, in that class, we examined the legal decisions behind several of the great cases in American history. Um, When reading the writings of the Supreme Court justices, one of the things in the process that is that they try to determine how the judge will view the original intent of the lawmakers. While while it's not always easy to get into the brains of the lawmakers, um, and well, Ken's not here, so I'll pick on politicians. Um, Maybe a stretch to say that politicians have brains. Don't quote me on that. Um, I'll delete that from the sermon, so there'll be no record of it. But um, one of the things they tried to do was to determine the intentions of the lawmakers. And it's not always easy, but it can prove to be a beneficial thing. It, it, It may be helpful, like it can be for judges, For us to go back and look at the original understanding of what the law was. The the King James, as so many have memorized this passage, translates this one of the Ten Commandments as, Thou shalt not kill. Um, Well, well, this isn't an incorrect translation. The the word kill may be a little bit broader than than actually what the the Hebrew has, since the verb in Hebrew is is not simply concerned with the ending of life. It, It really relates to the intentional ending of life. It it truly is what we would call murder. And what does it mean to murder? Certainly and probably most evidently, it's the the willful taking of another human life, whether it be in a moment of rage or one that was conducted with a great deal of planning. Taking that human life with with a degree of intention, that's murder. Equally important, though, in our understanding of murder is awareness that through an action, we can also be murders. There, there's an infamous murder that occurred in New York City in 1964. A young woman, Kitty Genovese, was stabbed repeatedly in a park just outside several apartment, apartments in the early morning hours. At least 38 people came to their windows and watched it happen. They heard her being stabbed. They heard her cries for help. They listened to her die. Yet no one called the police. No one called the paramedics. No one went down to help. Some didn't want to get involved. Others were fearful of retribution that they might experience. But an entire neighborhood did nothing as a woman was stabbed to death. Uh, According to the courts in our nation, they weren't guilty of committing any crime. There's no obligation to get involved. Our, Our nation says you don't have to step up. But God, on the other hand, says something else. You you see, choosing to help, choosing to act is not a legal choice. It's a moral choice. And it's immoral not to reach out in help. And so when we don't reach out to help, that can be murder as well. There's a fundamental truth that underlies this whole commandment of thou shalt not murder. It's evident in both interpretations that I shared with you. We're called to value human life. The the Hebrews were filled with knowledge that humanity was uniquely created in God's image, and as a result, it was to be treated with great care, with tender love. And our actions should reflect this to be the case, always giving a great measure of care to value life. I want to pause for a second. I, I, I know... That, that some in this church have served in the armed forces, have family who have served in the armed forces. Um, 
And I know that some of you may have been in positions where you had to take life or where they had to take a life. Um, I don't believe this commandment is speaking of those situations. I, I, think, I think acting on behalf of your nation in a just war is, is different from the kind of taking of a life that this commandment is speaking of. This, this commandment is really directed to individuals first and foremost. A acting on the just orders of a commander changes that dynamic. It, it, in the instance of World War II, fighting against Adolf Hitler was an action that was the valuing of human life. And it was just. That valuing of human life is so important, though. When, when we approach others with this firmly in our minds, it, the valuing of human life should change all of our interactions. When we see someone else as something precious, we're moved to act. We're moved to be life savers as opposed to life stealers. So, foundations. Foundations. That when we value human life, we're building on a foundation of rock, not sand. The Old Testament type of understanding of the law was rooted in the tangible act of murder, either by inaction or through committing the crime itself. It flowed from this commandment. It was rooted in the understanding that human life is precious. Now, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount brings what some view as a whole new interpretation of the law. Um, I'm going to say it's not a new interpretation. Instead, it's a deeper understanding it's a move away from just religion, just obedience to the letter of the law and digging into the heart of the law. And I, I think Jesus, in, in going deeper with it, is bringing the truest of interpretation. He was speaking to the original intent. His was not interpretation. He was speaking as the author of the law. And Jesus begins with this legal understanding. You have heard it said, do not murder. You could stop there, but he doesn't. He continues using the word but. In this case the, case, the word but does not serve to cancel out what came before. It's simply leading us deeper. It's as if Jesus is saying, you've heard it said, do not murder, yet there's even more to it. You see, Jesus understands that murder does not believe, begin with either action or inaction. That murder begins first in our heart. It's a theme <clears throat> that's going to be common in the next commandment as well. True murder occurs within a heart that's filled with anger and rage. Do you ever have a sense how angry people are anymore? We live in a world where things just seem to be on the verge of exploding all the time. We know people who have explosive tempers that rage at the smallest thing. That's a real problem. I, I first preached on this text 18 years ago, and I thought people were angry then. <coughs> Boy, was I wrong. Um, people are so much more angry now. It's only grown in the years since. It seems like most people just sit right on the edge of blowing up. But, but here's the thing. Anger isn't limited to people with a short fuse. I also sense that there are some very angry people who keep it deeply, deeply buried, who do their best not to rid themselves of their anger, but to simply suppress it. As, as a kid, I kind of had a short fuse. I, I could blow my top pretty quickly. I, I was out there with my... I have a cousin, Gerald. He, he didn't blow up. He just kind of, he was mellow all the time, except for I remember this one time where all of a sudden, all this pent-up rage um, built up inside of him. They had a stairway that was kind of enclosed and had a wall at the end, um, and this mellow, um, I, for the first dozen years of my life, I don't think I ever saw him even raise his voice. He was so mad, he took everything, I think, that was upstairs and threw them down the stairs. He had just lost it. Um, even the mellow people have this rage that builds up. They just may be, may be better at hiding it. Anger is a dangerous, dangerous trouble spot. Now, certainly not all anger is wrong. Um, our Lord demonstrated anger when he saw the abuses that were going on in the temple. And, and it, it is right for people to be angry with injustice. It's right to be angry with evil in the world. 
Yet, here's the reality. I think that for most of us, those aren't the things that make us angry, or at least that we get ticked off about. We get angry at the person who drives 45 with the speed limit is 65. Um, well, I guess I should say I get angry. I spent a fair amount of time in the car this week. I, I drove up to see LaVon in um, Kearney, and I had to drive down to Hayes. Um, I was real thankful I didn't get behind any slow-moving vehicles this time so that um, I could preach this sermon with integrity and say I drove this week without getting angry, because I did. Um, but the reality is, is, oh, driving can make me angry so fast. Um, or what about that person who stops too fast at, um, at a stop sign? Um, Harlan, how do, you, how do you feel about people who just rush right up to the stop sign and then brake at the last second? They don't change the brakes, right? That's right, yeah. We, we've had this conversation in car. I know that's one of those things that gets... Um, there are also people who start braking way too early. Um, those people drive me nuts. We get angry when we want things to go our way. We get angry when things don't go our way. We get angry when we, get what, when we don't get what we want. Um, we, get may, we get angry when choices are made that differ from what we want. Um, we get angry when our favorite team loses a game. Um, I don't think anybody here has to worry about that happening today. Um, anybody? Uh, uh, no. Um, see, so today you can be angry free with the Super Bowl. We get angry over bad service at a restaurant. We get angry when we sense that the wait in line is too long um, or that the help is incompetent. Um, children get angry with parents who seem to be too controlling and adults get angry with kids for not behaving. Our political leaders don't set a very good example. There's such anger and hostility in Washington that there seems to be no desire to even attempt to work together. It's true of both parties. They might sit next to each other at the State of the Union address, but deep down it seems that they often actively dislike each other. Here's the thing, it's true in our churches as well. Um, when I went to General Assembly a, a few years back now, I, I rose to speak in favor of an item of business that was calling for both sides uh, on the divide over homosexual ordination to, to, to recognize the hurts and wrongs that had been done to each other, the way that we didn't represent the body of Christ in our interactions. Um, it, it wasn't asking for anyone to change their views, just to work towards forgiveness. And, and as I stood there waiting to speak, I heard people sitting right next to me. They were sitting in there at the table right next to me. Um, they didn't know which way I was planning on speaking. Um, they were just grumbling, and they said, I will never forgive the people who left the denomination. Never. The hate was tangible. And, and, and sadly, their hatred was an echo of words that I'd heard from people who didn't support homosexual ordination as well. I'll never forgive those people for ruining my church. We kill each other left and right. And, and, and the ugly anger is rooted in the sense that I'm not getting things my way. So much hatred, so much anger. And, and, and it's not just anger, it's the things we say to one another. Mur murder starts in the heart, but so often it's reflected in the words that we, use, that we also use and the way they wound each other. Jesus offers two examples. In, in one, he says, anyone who says to his brother, Raka, um, or calls him empty-headed, that, that's what Raka really means. He's answerable to the courts. And the second, he says, anyone who says, you fool, will be answerable to God. The, the two words are, in essence, saying the same thing. It, it, it's not as if the second word is, is a stronger word. I, I think that Jesus is pointing out just how destructive the communication of our anger can be. The, the problem, the beginning of sin, starts with the ugliness in our hearts. We're broken when it hits there. But even more damage is done when we verbalize that anger, when we begin to tear people down. I, I know that on more than one occasion, I have had my heart ripped to shreds by cruel, by cruel words that have been said to me, words that then in me have started this wellspring of anger, words that have caused me then to lash back with her murderous heart. I, I remember being on a mission trip to Mexico. We were working with a group of kids in an orphanage. Most of the time was spent simply playing with the kids that were there. And I remember the wound that I received um, when these kids that at least I first thought were cute started running around me in a circle, pointing and chanting, gordo, 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 which if you don't know Spanish, you might think, oh, isn't that cute? They're singing a little song to Chris. Gordo means fatty in Spanish. 
These little four-year-olds were running around me in a circle singing, Fatty, 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 fatty. Um, it hurt. I was wounded. And, and you know what? It changed my attitude about those rotten little stinkers. Um, it made me angry. I, I kind of wanted to just stomp on them. That is not a righteous attitude. Um, it's honest, but it's not righteous. I, I've heard words said in church circles that are cruel, that rip people to shreds. I've heard words directed towards me, and I've heard them directed to order others, and I know we have hearts that are filled with anger, hearts that are far too often murderous. And here's the thing, I've heard those words come from my mouth too many times. And I know that I've been murdered in things that I've said. I, I was living in Hutchinson when the serial kill killer Dennis Rader was captured in Wichita. And you rem may remember that he was a church-going man. Um, he, he, he did all sorts of work around the church. He, um, and I remember one of my first thoughts would, was, what would it be like to be his pastor? To, to have this come out. How would he handle it, knowing that he had a mass murder in his congregation? That must have been a ter terrifically painful experience. And, and yet, as I reflect on the people that I've had in my churches, as I reflect on my own life, I, I realize um, that I'm looking out on a crowd of serial killers. I hate to break it to you, there are only murderers in the pews. This place is filled with people who have killed others. When I looked in the mirror this morning, I, I saw the face of a person who is a murderer. For in truth, we all have murderous hearts from time to time. If that makes you uncomfortable, if putting you together with, with the BTK serial killer makes you uncomfortable, it, it should. While your murder may have different consequences than those crimes, in God's eyes, the murder is just as real. The problem is so real that, that we need to do something about it. And, and Jesus, when he was preaching, he recognized that. The, this past year, I reconnected with a former co-worker. We're friends now, um, and it was a good reconnect. When we were working with each other, um, we used to tease one another a whole lot. Our conversation was often filled with sarcastic comments and cutting remarks. It, it was all meant to be in good fun on, on both sides. There really wasn't a cruel subtext. Um, but at some point, those words began to eat away at both of us. Some, some comment was made that maybe um, penetrated in a way that it wasn't intended to. And, and caused a little bit of a wound, and that wound started to fester, and it caused a life back. I don't even remember which way where the festering started first. But, but those words that were said in jest initially changed to words that, that were being said to hurt. We, we'd gone from being playfully wound, playful with each other to being murderous in our conversation. We were both wounded, and we wanted to hurt back. We were both dying and wanted the other one to die. Finally, it got to a point where our friendship was dead. The line, it was flat line. And our professional relationship was barely functioning. Um, we wouldn't talk to each other. We wouldn't sit next to each other in staff meetings. Um, and then we began to talk. Um, we began to share the way that we'd hurt each other. In fact, I, I think the conversation probably was even started off to hurt more, um, to cause more wounding. Um, but from there, we began to realize the hurt that we caused to each other. We began to apologize and to reconcile. We began to heal. So, soon that friendship was restored, all because we began the process of reconciliation. As we talked a couple of months ago, we reflected on the foolishness of what had happened and talked about how glad we were that we ended our time working together as friends, not enemies, that we had, that we had reconciled, that we had recognized the sin and the harm that we'd caused towards one another, and we made our peace. Friends, we have to be in the business of reconciliation. The first part of reconciliation is to have a heart that is willing to forgive. Are you ready to move beyond the hatred in your heart, the, the desire to wound where you've been wounded. A, a pastor that I know was greatly hurt by some of the members of his congregation and his staff. The matter, in, in many ways, was, was really trivial. 
and, and both sides were less than righteous in how they chose to handle it. After fighting a whole lot of battles through the channels that are provided for in the church structure they brought in, um, they brought in an administrative commission. Karen knows a little bit about administrative commissions, but this one is the really unfun kind um, because it's to sort out conflict. It's hard enough to close a church, but to, to solve the problem when a church and their pastor are in at war with one another, it's brutal. But they worked through that. Um, five of the 12 members of the session left the church. They just upped and walked out. They were followed by the church's Christian education director and a bunch of other families. The pastor, he was, he was gutted by the situation. Um, and about a year after the mass exodus, the Christian educator came back to church and, and apologized. She apologized in person. She gave him a letter of apology saying that she had handled it in a horrible way. Um, the pastor was stunned. He, he was thankful to receive it. He was grateful. It was the beginning of healing in that relationship. And, and it made me happy to see God at work. And, but after he told me that story, I was stunned when I heard him say that if a certain elder, he gave her name, came to and apologized, he would refuse to accept it, that he'd feel like spitting in her face. His heart continued to be so filled with hate and anger that it didn't long to heal. He's a pastor. Where, where is the ministry? Where is the modeling of Christ? Don't be like that pastor. May, may you actively be praying and may we be praying for one another that we will have hearts that are forgiving even before forgiveness is asked for. May we be like Christ who in spite of all the wounds, wounds that we brought that literally left him dying on a cross, that he brought forgiveness. The second part requires for us to go out and to seek that forgiveness. Jesus tells us that before we can even really worship, before we're truly able to live into the commandment to remember the Sabbath, that we need to seek out people that we are at odds with and seek reconciliation. For, for us, that doesn't mean that we're called to point out where others are wrong. It's not, oh, well, you do this, and you do this, and you do this, and it irritates me. Um, and, and instead, forgiveness starts with us going out and admitting where we're wrong. We need to admit the hate and the anger that we have in our hearts and confess not just to God, but to one another, the murderous hearts we have and to seek peace. You know, Jesus directs us to do this all because the human life is valuable, and we should treat it as such. It's not just a matter of jumping through the simple hoops. I am reasonably confident. Um, I hope that I can even go stronger than that. But I'm reasonably confident that not one of you has done something that could get you convicted of murder. Um, if you can, we, if you have, we can talk. And I will probably turn you in. But we can talk. Um, but I'm reasonably certain that, that that hasn't happened. But that's just the religious side of it. When it comes to going deeper, when it comes to having this living faith, we have to recognize that we all have brought harm that is equal to murder. And when we do that, we're recognizing, we're forgetting that life is valuable. And so we need to treat life as valuable. Jesus teaches us to look at others as being more valuable than even ourselves. I believe that in this one command, we see much of the heart of the whole of the Ten Commands. For in valuing human life, we come to understand that it's far more than just ourselves. It calls for us to have a greater concern for others. In our reconciliation, we reach out, putting our own hurts aside and offering our apologies unconditionally to one another. Earlier in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus made a statement that I hope may be true for, for us. When we live into it, we will find that we are less and less murderous all the time. For blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. So go out and be peacemakers, seeking reconciliation. Amen. Won't you stand with me as we sing number 477, our closing hymn this morning, More About Jesus Would I Know.
you have homework this week. Sorry. Um, the Chiefs aren't playing. You've got time this afternoon to work on it. Um, your homework is to do some looking at your heart. Who are people in your heart that maybe you have a murderous attitude towards, that maybe you have anger and hostility towards? And, and your homework this week is to reach out, to, to begin those steps of making peace. We all have people who we struggle with. It's a reality. Um, and we all need to be modeling what Christ did and to offer forgiveness. Jesus says, before you go to church, you should do that. So, so your assignment next week is before you come back, um, begin that process of reconciliation. If you don't get there, still come back next week. Um, because this is a place of grace. This is a place where we encounter God who will strengthen us to do it. But may we take steps to be less murderous in our hearts. Now may the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit rest and be upon each and every one of you, now and forevermore. Amen.